Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. What is up, everyone? I am your host, Charlie Shrem, and you're listening to another epic episode of Untold Stories and the Charlie Shrem Show, where twice a week together, we get to dive deep with some of crypto's most influential leaders, not just the leaders, but the people training the leaders to truly understand how this move, movement came to be, where we are right now, uh, the stories that kind of got us in, uh, those things that got us really excited, what are the upcoming themes of the year? People are constantly asking me, asking you guys, I'm sure, like, what are you investing in? What's happening? Where are the entrepreneurs working in? What blockchains are the developers, you know, hanging out at? Which conferences are people at? Like, where's the culture right now? All these kind of questions you guys have, and we hopefully have the answers. And I'm really, really, really excited today to have Jessica Levac. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. You are the executive director of the crypto the cryptocurrency certification consortium C four because it's four C's. That's great. Why don't you do there's like? A, yeah, sorry. there's a reason why there's a reason why we say C four because cryptocurrency <laughs> certification consortium is a multiple. Yeah, there you go. That's that's great. Uh, and kind of we were we were rummaging uh, earlier and talking about how um, I get to talk to so many of those folks who have great ideas start crypto businesses and end up being highly successful and some of the, the the great companies out there today some of the great projects those that are hiring hundreds if not thousands of people you know our industry hasn't been around for decades that you can be grown into groomed and then learn from people's experience you also right now there's a lot of training uh that goes on and and if all the entrepreneurs that we meet are the gladiators and the trailblazers. Jessica, you are training those gladiators and trailblazers. Yes, absolutely. And I think the first step is making sure people know they should be trained to be gladiators um, and then taking it from there to show them what we think that they should be learning. And by we, I mean the community. It's super important that it's not just a couple people deciding what matters, what's important for people to learn and understand. And so we're, we're a nonprofit, but all of our content is sourced from the community and through community volunteers. So our committees have people on it who don't necessarily agree with each other or have the same viewpoints, which is extremely important because we want to bring these different people together to figure out kind of what the most unbiased source of information can be. I want to actually completely uh, jump from, from this topic to another one really quickly is that we're seeing the, politis the politicization, politicization, uh, excuse me, English isn't my first language, uh, the politicalization of uh, of education. We're seeing it all over the news. We're seeing it um, you know, where we live. We're seeing, uh, especially like here in Florida, um, school board members have become like part of uh, political parties and they're running on their like political platform and things like that. And I always thought that the education system that taught me, taught you, that taught most of my listeners, wherever they are, was like a non-political body. Is it? Uh, definitely not. I come from higher ed, but you know, if I think back and, and I think you said you're, you're in Florida, right? So yeah. no child left behind, I believe started there, but that's kind of my first memory of something with education being politicized. And so before I was in crypto, I worked in higher ed. So I'm a former college professor and associate dean, and I worked for the city colleges of Chicago. And a lot of these public schools are it is political and it goes all the way up because there are often agendas that people have and it creeps into education in terms of what people should be learning, what learning objectives are and who is deciding what people should learn is I think really problematic because if you're one of the decision makers for I mean, K through 12 in particular, you probably want people to learn what you believe. And that definitely impacts how all of us go through the education system, particularly I'm speaking um, about the United States. Yeah, it it kind of creeps me out to think that folks have an agenda that they want to influence children or young folks who c can't really think for themselves yet. And people are planning agendas that early on for like decades from now. That's oh, the yeah. scary thing. That sounds like... It's 
what Hitler did. It's terrifying. Yeah, it is very terrifying, I think. And that's kind of why, or definitely why at C4, we like to have people who come from different backgrounds, have different beliefs, so that what we're sharing is as unbiased as possible. Obviously, everyone has their opinion, but in terms of the content we want, it's just straight facts about crypto, about Bitcoin, about Ethereum. So not necessarily our opinion on it, but why it exists, what it does, and it is hard, I think, even to separate from that because why I think Bitcoin matters is something that can be politicized. It's not just I happen to like it. It's because I want it to change the world. I think it is. Trust me, I think the past six months and the next year I've been spending and I will be spending so much time focusing on what it means to be a Bitcoiner living in a, in a crypto world. And I just was in, in Quantum Miami conference last week. I was talking to Brock Pierce and I were having this exact conversation. Like there's a reason, and I know you're very close with Andreas Antonopoulos as well, who's one of the first people who educated me uh, when I was just a fledgling, fledgling young child in, in, in Bitcoin land and I needed education and direction. Uh, he was there uh, and he's probably taught and educate, uh, educated half of half or more of of my listeners uh and his a lot of his education is out there for free that anyone can go watch and read and, and listen in multiple books and videos and so like that that common goal that we all have exists in bitcoin and crypto right like we so no matter all you have all the committees that you have that's forming this education and the certification so these people will go on and found the companies and work for the for us in crypto land but there's a common goal, right, to make the world a better place. And so that's what even though you have people that are competing or don't like or have different narratives and storylines, you can kind of compromise and come together. Is that what brings everyone together? Yeah, well, and the reason that C4 started in 2014 was because Michael Perklin and Joshua McDougall, the co-founders, realized that there is no way to hire people and be sure that they actually understood how Bitcoin worked because there, there was no benchmark to measure that. And so the exam came about because it's 20 minutes, 75 questions, and people can prove whether they understand Bitcoin or not. And it helped them with hiring. Oh my God, I love Michael Perklin. You have, you just brought back a name that I haven't thought thought about since like 2016 or something. Oh yeah, he's the chairman of the board for C4. So you guys have really taken on the mantle of preserving the education and the early days of, of the history of Bitcoin and kind of like the narratives around that. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there any like public facing information and things like that? Well, so we have tons of info about Bitcoin that and Ethereum were chain agnostic on our um, website and we've got blog posts, we've got videos and whatnot. It's, it's interesting to figure out how to create educational content that's free because we want everyone to have access to it and still survive as a nonprofit. I think what we would all like to do would just be to say, here's everything we can create and, yeah. you know, but we have to also, you know, make a profit. So it's about finding a way to continuously release free content while at the same time surviving. And so I've seen a lot of crypto Bitcoin courses and um, certifications that are literally like thousands of dollars. And yes. I think that that is preventing the majority of people who we want to understand how Bitcoin works from really learning about it. Because if, if we look at some of these countries or locations where people don't have the same access to financial security that at least in the United States, many of us do have, we're preventing them from learning. It's like, oh yeah, you can learn about what will you know, change your life if you can pay $1,000, which you can't. So good luck. Versus people like I think C4 and like you said, Andreas were saying, here is some free content so that you can learn like everybody else. And then if, well, we also do a lot of discounts for what we have, but like our course is um, $60 currently. Yeah. Our exam is a hundred um, and it's very intentionally priced so that people around the world are more likely to be able to learn from us and to um, become certified. And then also the students or people that need that extra help, we often do discounts for it just because our mission remains the same that it was in 2014. Educational content, being, people being able to prove that they understand 
crypto and Bitcoin so that you are able to hire and work with people who really get it rather than are just saying, oh, look, I did all this stuff on Twitter. I must get it. And that's so important because take, going back to the security yeah. point of view, if you don't really understand how it works and what it can do and why you need to take security seriously, then it doesn't do what we want it to do which I would say speaks to decentralization and the number of people that are choosing to use crypto, use Bitcoin in a centralized way. On the, on the security front, that being the, one of the big themes of the year and being where we failed ourselves in the last year or two, what education or what type of courses have you added in the last would you say three to six months that that's new information because this is constantly evolving. This is not like you're, we're taking history courses from, from a hundred years ago. Well, and that's one of the challenges because the industry, the space moves so quickly. We need to make sure we're keeping up with it. So our cryptocurrency security standard was first written in 2015 and it has been updated over the years as cryptocurrencies have grown. So it used to just be focused on Bitcoin, but there are so many other coins out there and tokens that we need to make sure that we're making it safe for all types of people. And our exam for the cryptocurrency security standard to have auditors out there being able to look into cryptocurrency systems and key management didn't wasn't released until this summer. And that's because you have to keep updating the standard and the committee is a bunch of volunteers in the cybersecurity space. So they're looking through it. And but we're finally at a place now, which is really exciting that the standard is continuously being updated. And we have these security auditors that we we certify them, but we're we're working on the training materials for it, but they're third party auditors. So they're not C4 representatives, which is super important because we want to make sure people understand the standard and are able to go out and do these audits and assessments. And they decide not C4, because if we're deciding, then we're biased. It should be a bunch of different people who are coming together and um, you know creating the standard. And then people who understand the standard going out and doing these audits and companies are able to select who they think um, is a good, secu like is a security ex expert and would be a good CCSS, CCSSA. We have a lot of acronyms that are difficult to say, so bear with me. No, it's important because the acronyms create standards. So how does someone join one of these committees though, if they're, if they, they're really, really involved in a specific area of crypto? Well, so what's actually pretty exciting is our team is growing and we are creating new um, volunteer materials so that more people are able to get in and volunteer. I want to volunteer. And so, okay, awesome. Yeah, well, okay. I will send you a link to the I form. Know. You can, there's, there's a link on our website, but we're changing it to make it easier for people to volunteer as not necessarily just a committee member, but maybe you don't have the amount of time needed to be a committee member, but you want to create content or something that you want to be released and have it be free. And so um, that's, I'll, I'll, I can give you the link. I would love if you would volunteer. But the main thing I think for us is that we wouldn't exist if it wasn't for people that care about Bitcoin and crypto who are volunteering their time basically like it's people who really care that are good people that are involved with c4 and that i think is what makes us the organization we are it really is it's not like oh well, i'm going to get paid x amount of dollars we've got to currently have two full-time people um and we've got some contractors but the majority is pulled from the community and like we're at some point going to do more um public calls. So we do live streams, but I want to have more people be able to see kind of how the committees come to decisions about what should be in our yeah. educational content and on the exams. Cause they, I've seen our CCSS committee spend an entire meeting talking about one sentence in the standard. I want to be in that meeting. That's like my dream we, job right It's there. fascinating That's to hear these job. people. Yeah. It's really, really cool. Um, and I, I'm lucky I'm doing my dream job. So, and I don't think many people can say that. So, um, and I think that, yeah, it's because of our volunteers and our board 
Um, we the board actually Vitalik Buterin used to be a board member, but right now it's Andrea Antonopoulos, Pamela Morgan, Michael Perkland, and Joshua McDougall. And um, they really just care about education and certification and making the space safer. And so everything we do is with that in mind. And it's pretty cool to work, I would say with people, I don't really want to say for, but with people who have this mentality that if we're doing good, then we're doing a good job. And I've experienced working at places where that's not the case, but as long as we're making this cryptocurrency space safer, then we're reaching our goals. And that all starts with education, I think. How would I know if, for example, me as a VC, I'm investing in a company who some team members have been certified? Is there some sort of like symbol or, I know we're crypto yeah. podcast, so I might as well say an NFT maybe? So we have a, we've got the certified Bitcoin professional and certified Ethereum professional, and it, we've got a lookup on our site for people. We don't have NFTs for it. Oh, cool. So there's um, a lookup. Interesting. Yeah. So you can look up to make sure that someone's actually certified. And this is becoming even more important with the CCSS because our auditors are going in, or they're not our auditors, but CCSSAs, these auditors are going in and looking into these cryptocurrency systems. And so you need to, one, be able to make sure that the auditor is a legit auditor. So we're listing these wow. individuals on our website. And the second piece is that we need to make sure that the companies whose systems are being certified are able to prove that they're certified. So there's a lot of misinformation out there with people, with organizations claiming that they are CCSS certified and they're not. And so that's something we're working on now, making sure people know, like go to our website, check it out. Because we just released the auditor exam, we're just starting to see organizations going through this process for their systems. And the important thing to note is that we're not, having companies get certified. We're having companies systems certified because you could have different cryptocurrency systems and one might be more secure than another. And so the auditor's definitely looking specifically at the different systems. Take that a step further though. Like how do we roll that into, I mean, that's the probably what ended the bull market other than the macro situation was that a, a, most of our, products and services broke from centralized finance to half of DeFi being hacked. It felt like, you know, it felt like the old days where the Vikings and the Saxons or whoever was invading England. It's just relentless and nonstop. Mm -hmm. uh, if we could change that, if we can require some sort of like standard for not just the services and the companies, but also even a step further, like some self-regulatory organization I mean, you go right now and you want to invest in securities or brokerages. You go to a website that offers securities. You see on the bottom that they're a member of FINRA and then you're comfortable. FINRA started as a self-regulatory organization, didn't it? So there's got to yeah, be a so, way. Well, and I think that's what we're going towards. And there are certain companies that want their systems to be certified because they take security very seriously. Like Fireblocks is the first yeah. certified mm -hmm. system. Very and cool. they came to us and were like, when is this going to be available? Because we want to go through the process. And it was actually pretty cool to hear from their team. Their team told me that it was a more difficult audit than they expected. They thought it would be not that rigorous. And they were surprised at how rigorous it was, which I think is a great, great selling point. Basically, if it was easy and everyone could do it, then what's the point of having it? So there's um, the standard, it's pretty robust. There's three different levels of security. There's level one, two, and three. Three is the most secure and level one is still considered very secure. Most custodians, companies would not reach level one, in my opinion. I have no proof of that, but that is what I think. Um, so I'm really excited for, like personally, as a user, even if you aren't using a centralized exchange, but like maybe you just are, you know, selling something for, it's only on there for a, a minute. If you do that and they happen to go down in that one minute that you've got your stuff on that exchange, you know, you're SOL. So as a user, I want to see this, but also as someone that just loves Bitcoin, I really, really want these 
hacks, these lost keys, all of this to stop happening so that mass adoption becomes something that is not scary. Like it's not going to happen if we don't make the yeah. space safer. And I always joke that I can't wait until I'm able to go home and visit my mom. And there aren't these articles that she's clipped out of the newspaper for me <laughs> about how, you know, I'm in this crazy criminal space. Um, so yeah. I really, I really think that being able to prove that you're more secure or that you're doing everything you can is the key to all of us being able to have more trust. I was in a, I was in an Uber the other day and my Uber driver asked me if I was the crypto podcast guy. And then I said, yes. And then he asked me if, um, what tips or I, or thoughts, you know, what I have for someone who's never been involved in the space, uh, what would advice would I give him? And I had like four minutes till they dropped me off. And so I really wanted to give him a good answer and leave him. One of the first things I said is like any project that your friend creates, don't get involved in because it's probably going to be like a, a scam or something like that. But what, what, I mean, what would you, what, what advice would you give this Uber driver from a security perspective? If, you know, if, if they want to come and use a DAP or if they want to engage in a blockchain or protocol, or they just simply want to buy some Bitcoin and they're not sure where to do it. Yeah. I think just starting from the basics and looking online to see who is trusted and then you deciding if you should trust them. Um, and there is misinformation out there. So go and look and see, are these people saying the same thing? Are multiple people from different sources, from different organizations saying similar things for security or not? And if they are, then you can start to kind of collate that information so that you're able to like separate the truth from what isn't true. But I do think that that is a huge problem. Anybody can say anything on the internet, which I actually think is a good thing, but it means that we have to do the work. Um, obviously, I think C4 is a good place to go, but I always will say, don't just trust me in saying that. Oh. Um, I could just be making that up. So don't believe me, go out, do the research, check, see who is on our board, see who our committee members are, see what we've produced and what people have said about it. And then compare and contrast. Are we saying that there are 21 million Bitcoin and everyone else is saying that there's 50? Because then we'd be wrong, right? But so you, you just need to look and see what are the facts being shared and are they facts, I guess. How many people are you certifying right now? How many people are going through the system? We have thousands of people certified as CBPs. So Bitcoin is our biggest one and then Ethereum and then the auditor exam. And actually I'm really excited because what we've been doing so far has been, we've got these committees based on either the standard or the exam. And we just created a new committee. It's called the Cryptocurrency Essentials Committee. And it's not focused on preparing for an exam. Our goal is to create general material that is again, created by a bunch of different volunteers from different walks of life. And they have to agree on it before they push it out. There's a consensus. And that information is just going to be about what people are telling us, what the community is telling us they want to learn. So we're going to be listening to the community. We're doing polls. We're asking what people want to learn when they start, where where they get most confused and going from there. And what are some one of the, of the things, answers? Um, minting an NFT, okay. figuring out how to set up a wallet. Um, and I think that there's a lot that people don't know that they need to know. And I'm not saying that like in a negative way. I think all of us don't know what we need to know if we don't know. Like you don't have the information you don't have. So in order for someone to just come in and say, I'm brand new to Bitcoin. Yeah. This, I need to know X, Y, and Z. Yeah. They have no idea where to start. So yeah. it's having the information that they don't know that they need to know being available. And I think a big piece of that is security. When I yeah. left higher ed in, I think it was 2017, I didn't know what a password manager was. I didn't know anything about security. And looking back, I'm kind of horrified. Um, but higher ed isn't the most... Um, advanced place to be in terms of technology. It's basically like still in the 90s. So you don't have those, uh, like I, I really didn't know how insecure my systems were. 
And so then coming in, and I was very lucky that the people that brought me into the cryptocurrency Bitcoin space were people who I already knew from other walks of life. And so I trusted them as they started to walk me through how to be more secure, how to set up a password manager, um, all of the things with, you know, figuring out a hardware wallet and whatnot. If I hadn't, I don't know if I would have been comfortable getting into the cryptocurrency space. And I had people who were very much like, here are the things you need to do to be secure. Double check what we're saying. Don't just trust us. Go look and make sure that you know what you're doing and um, that other people are saying this. Yeah, exactly. And like I had a friend who helped me set up my um, first hardware wallet, a, a Trezor. And the way that she did it was very much like, don't show me anything. Don't trust anyone, this and that. And it was not in a scary way, though. It was in like a comforting way. Like, this is so cool. You don't need anybody to help you to do this. So I'll explain to you, double check, go through and set this all up in a way that you feel comfortable with. And that is the piece that I think is missing a lot. Like Andreas has a course about how to set up a hardware wallet. And I love that because there are reviews on it and people can say whether they did or not, but he's very clear about not giving your keys to anyone and being just all of those basic things that maybe we might not know and need to know. Speaking of, yeah, for the last actually like three to six months, one of our sponsors was a hardware wallet company called SafePal. I have one of theirs right here. They're not our sponsor anymore, but I love I love that company. I, I think I'm going to give them two weeks of free ads just because I want people uh, 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 for Valentine's Day to like, you know, buy their loved ones a, uh, a hardware wallet. You need one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you do need one and you need help to figure out how to set it up. And that's one of the things that our cryptocurrency essentials committee is also doing, wanting to create more information that's out there available for how do you set this up? What are the first steps? And even like, what do you need to know to get there? Because I, as somebody who is not technologically, I'm, I would say I'm technologically inept most of the time. And so for someone like me to have figured this out and to feel comfortable, I feel like anyone can. It is a different world. But once you yeah, have you good set teachers. Yourself as a standard. What were you going to say? Sorry, I interrupted you. No, I was just going to say once you have good teachers and you know what it is, it's not that complicated. Not to say that it's easy and you don't need to spend any time on it, but it's less confusing than I think we make it out to be, mostly because a lot of the languages, language that's used is like, it's really right. intimidating. Hey, do people come to get certified who already are working in the space or some people who are looking to work in the space? Do you help with employment? Um, we don't have a system set up to, I mean, this is one of the things I would love to do to help people enter the the workforce, but it's definitely, if you're trying to find a job to be able to say you're a certified Bitcoin professional is a good way to, to prove that you understand it. But yeah. so we have people who just um, take the exam because they want to prove to themselves that they understand it. It's 20 minutes. It's a quick exam. Either you know it or you don't. 75 questions, like okay, rapid I'm fire. I'm going to fail. <laughs> Everybody says I don't think you will, but if I feel like it's a good way to give yourself that confidence. That's kind of what it did for me to feel like, okay, so I do know what I'm talking about. This proves it. This um, is great. This is cool. Yeah. And if you're a geek like me, which yeah. I think you are, it's like, it's so nerdy, but to be like, yes, I've proven this to myself. Like I get it. It feels, I don't know, it feels good, but there are companies out there that have all of their employees either getting certified or taking our course. And what's kind of fun is seeing some people who I know in the crypto space who are kind of like top, top, top of the heap in terms of like their companies coming Mm -hmm. in and getting recertified again and again, and their names coming across. I just saw somebody who is signed up for our Bitcoin course, who has been in the space for longer than I have. Um, And I'm guessing he just wanted to do a refresher and see what the course is like. But it's fun to know that there are people that are, you know, I would consider already experts. Probably get nervous to take the test. (laughs) You know, when I first took the exam, it was right before we had a conference in 2019. And we were going to announce that I was the executive director. And I took it the night before. I'd had plenty of time to prepare and take it. But I procrastinated, of course. And then I was like, oh, I have to do this before. 
I was so nervous to take it because I was going to have to take my brand, tell my brand new bosses if I failed or not. And I was like, oh God, this is going to be horrible. (laughs) Luckily I passed, but that's why we started to create educational materials. Because when I was studying, I mean, one, I come from higher ed and I love education, but also as I was studying for it, I was like, where am I even supposed to go to make sure that the information is accurate and you know, watching videos of a variety of different people is really time consuming. Yeah. And then you have to do the double checking and all of that. And so that's why we decided to start creating this educational material. Hey, would you ever consider offering to help someone like myself or other folks develop an actual like course that we can go to our local university and offer to teach it? Because I've like offered to teach Bitcoin and crypto to my, to the local schools around here is more volunteering, but they come back and say, write a course. And I'm like, I don't know how to write. I don't even know what that looks like. Well, so a lot of, I wouldn't say a lot, but there are colleges and universities that use our certified Bitcoin professional prep um, prep book. It's for the exam um, in their college courses and then have their students take the exam as part of it. I've seen this in undergrad and grad school. Mm -hmm. Um, And So I think that's a good start, but also our study guide for the Bitcoin exam is free. It's online and it's a really good, um, like it's a good basically curriculum for what you need to know. It's kind of like a syllabus basically, but also if you want to do that, I've taught a course and have the material already. So I'd be happy to share that. But I think that's a cool idea for a like a working group through C, through C4, people who want to increase education and they want to create this material that's yes. accessible to more people. And one of the other things we're working on doing is we've got, we do trivia at a lot of different events because it's a good way to learn. Uh, our trivia is funny. So it's, it's pulled from our exam, but then there's usually like an extra question or answer in there that's silly so that you're not just, you know, sitting there, but then we explain why that's the answer and it's a good way to learn. Oh, but what so we're cool. going to be doing yeah, is making the trivia available for meetups and schools and whatnot so people can use what already exists to help teach. And we're not spending time redoing something that is already there. Like repurposing content, I feel like is something that we're not doing in the Bitcoin space. And we should be. If it already exists, why are we spending time? Well, I guess because of money, but like, why do we keep redoing things that exist? So anyways, you can take, I'll send you my slides and what I've done. Yeah, please. Shit. I mean, you guys can license that out to like Milton Bradley and do like Trivia Pursuit Crypto Edition or something. I think one of the struggles that C4 has is that, oh my gosh, don't get me started on games. I would love that, the games are to everything. do. Yeah. I am the same way. And so actually, um, like, Josh McDougall and Michael Perklin and I are love board games. And so, uh, oh gosh, don't get me started Do on another project. Catan group? <laughs> really? I like... love Catan. Yeah. I do. I love it. Shit, I'm going to get like half of my listeners are going to email me now. Like, I want to play Catan too. We need to start. That's a great idea. Oh my gosh. I love that game. And actually one of my um, favorite memories of my dad was whenever he played, he would always mess up. He'd be like, okay, I'll do like sheep for wheat. And then he and my sister-in-law would both have sheep. Like every single time they tried to trade, they both had the same thing. It's like, but these are, these kind of games I feel like could be used to treat, like, I mean, you're basically learning about barter from these games. Monopoly but as kids, we all learned economics. Yeah, but we don't know that we're learning it. We don't then take that next step. And it's crazy to think like some of these games are how we learned, like you said, like Monopoly and economics but we're not learning about it in elementary school and middle school and high school for the most part, because I I don't really know why, but there are these games out there that are fun that could be teaching us how to do it. We, you and I have talked about how, um, you know, you go through school and you learn something like I told you a story about how um, I learned how to sew in school and how to do um, how to sew a bear, which I couldn't do. I sewed through my finger. My mom (laughs) had to finish it for me and she even screwed it up. And her mom was a seamstress and she sewed the ass like on the front. So it was like face ass of the bear. It was hilarious. Uh So like, 
we're learning skills like that for absolutely no reason. And then we're not learning the skills that I think are like life skills that we need to understand. And it really, as an educator and just a human, it pisses me off. You're, you're preaching to the choir. I mean, especially in the last, it sucks because the last year, I don't know what happened, but education got very political and, and especially like you see all over the news how you know schools have to remove all their books to get checked for compliance uh it sounds like a prison yeah um i didn't even know we lived in an era that books would you know I, it just does i i guess i'm happy that i'm not a child today but it scares me because i thought that my generation grew up with trauma i can't even imagine what the, the kids in our days are growing up with there's this great book called the book thief i read it a long time oh, ago that's a great and book. i want to you, yeah, where it's it like, yeah, um, if whoever's listening, if you haven't read it, it's very interesting to think about how things that make a difference in the world can disappear suddenly and it becomes like illegal against the rules to then be using something and it's just because of the perspective of a certain group of people. The laws exist already. If if, for example, something was not allowed to be in your home, like a book, for example, and a, a, an administration decades from now wanted to, to, to do that, the laws exist. Like, it's not it's not a far cry from where we can go. And it's a very scary thing. And if you start, I forget there was a quote. It's like, if you start with books, I forget where this quote is. It's terrible. Um, but there, someone can look it up. Um, or I'll edit it in later, but there's a quote about this, about like, if you the, if the books are the first thing to go, then you know, like, you know, things are gonna go downhill from there. But um, it's really amazing what you guys are doing. And it's very important because actually that was the theme of, of what I talked about with all those people in, 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 the, in the Bitcoin conference last week was that all the education around Bitcoin and crypto has become like tribalism, toxic, bias, just become like, not fun and the and culture has become bitcoin and crypto culture has become like but it's over the that the, that's one of the things that the bear market did kill so that a lot of that went away and so i really appreciate what you guys are doing um i'm gonna have all the links to everything that we talked about in the show notes here um so everyone can can check it all out and and, and get the websites but um, um jessica levac thank you so much for taking the time and coming on on the show today you taught me so much you taught the, the listeners so much and uh and hopefully we can we can work together on some things yeah i would love that and i just want to like psa before um we go is for those people who are using centralized exchanges or using cryptocurrency systems that aren't just your own like hardware wallets start looking for the ccss logo on these systems because the systems, the companies that really care about security are going to be doing this just because they care. The systems um, of companies that don't aren't going to. And this is a way for us as um, users to try to make the space safer. And I think it's really important. I've spoken to people who don't care about the, the standard because they don't care about security. And these are people that work for companies that we all know of. And it's terrifying to think of that. So I would say, pay attention to it, look for it, help us make the space safer. I mean, it was created by cybersecurity and Bitcoin experts. And um, you can look at our committees to see who um, is doing this. And also give us feedback. If you look at our standard or any of our content and you're like, I disagree with this, tell us. We want to hear from people because we're only as strong as the community allows us to be basically. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was very nice chatting.